Hello, my name is Mr. Tom Froze, and these are my thoughts on illustration. This is a bi-weekly podcast about showing up and growing up as an illustrator. Welcome to episode seven. Do you want comfort or solutions? This is a question we can ask our partner or spouse or a friend when they're going through a hard time. Sometimes we just need to vent. We want to be heard and know that someone is on our side. We're not looking for a quick fix or a report on all the ways in which something might be our fault. Maybe we're not even looking to solve the problem, whatever that might be. There are times when we just want to be comforted or to know we're not crazy. Getting feedback can be a lot like navigating this question. Do you want comfort or solutions? Because I think in our work, we want both. And we need both. Sometimes we need comfort and sometimes we need solutions. Today we're gonna start looking into the topic of feedback as in getting feedback on our illustrations or our artwork. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I spent almost a week writing this episode because it just started to unravel in unexpected ways. I thought I was gonna give you a list of ways to get feedback depending on your situation, but it turned out to be a bit more abstract and, well, the content got really long. And what's funny is this episode was supposed to be the follow-up to the last episode. So it looks like the whole subject of knowing if our work is good and how to know for sure is turning into a big saga. I'm sorry to drag it on like this, but when you have a podcast called Thoughts on Illustrations, sometimes you get lost in your thoughts. I get lost in my thoughts and, well, I guess you get to come along for the ride. So today, we're going to dip our toes in with a reflection on this question of comfort versus solutions with a focus more on the comfort side of things. Then in episode eight, we'll get more into the nitty gritty world of solutions. So I'm just acknowledging that this one is going to be a little bit more on the short and sweet side, but I hope the fact that episode eight, the next episode is going to be at least twice as long will make up for it. Anyway, we're going to get into it right after these messages. If you like what you hear in today's episode, you can support me by following me and rating and reviewing this podcast wherever you happen to be listening from. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And maybe leave me a little feedback in the comments about how this episode helped you today. You can also support me on Patreon, where you can get exclusive access to my live monthly drawing meetups and more. Join today at patreon.com slash Tom Why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we stand on stages risking making fools of ourselves? Why do we need to show everyone the art we made when maybe people won't like it? What is it about being an artist or a designer or an illustrator that we have to put ourselves and our work out there. Why can't we just create stuff for ourselves? Like, isn't it enough just to make something in private, maybe in our sketchbooks or in the privacy of our painting studios? What drives us to have to make work that other people see? What makes us think that others even want to see it? Obviously, art is made to be shared and art is communication. We express things in our illustrations and our paintings, our drawings, our designs, or whatever. And that's just the nature of what we do. There's something very instinctual about making images for other people to see. It's a primal impulse to etch, I was here on the bathroom stall, or to paint animals on the walls of a cave. Art, like music, is meant to be shared and hopefully enjoyed by those around us. As artists, we're born to make and share. So why do we make art? Like, why do you make art? And what drives you to share it? I often think about how children instinctively run up to their parents with a drawing they made, maybe a painting, 
and they say with excitement, look what I made. Why do we do this as children? Like, what's going on here? I'm trying to think back to when I was a kid doing this. There is definitely the excitement of just having created something with my own hands and being amazed at the fact that I could create something from nothing, like from my head onto paper. But when I share it with my parents or when I shared it with my parents, it was all about their reaction. Wow, Tommy, good job. Or thank you, this is amazing, this is beautiful. Think about it. When you were a kid and you'd show your work to your parent or teacher or other big person in your life, wouldn't you simply be excited to share it because you thought they'd be excited to see it? Early on in our lives, we developed this expectation that somebody cares about the things we create. When we're young, it's often very true that our big people do care. They are excited about what we make. As a father, I can tell you that I'm deeply interested in what my kids make, and especially when they first started to draw. You know, from around the age of two, it was really cool just to see how they developed as these tiny little artists. And as an illustrator and a parent, I'm of course very interested just to see what kind of artistic talent my kids came preloaded with and, and what happens as that develops. Like, are they going to be a chop off the old block? Are they going to be something totally different? All this to say, I'm tuned in to what my kids make and when they share their art with me, I do my best to encourage them and to praise them for their creativity. And usually that comes quite naturally. But if you're a parent, you also know that after a while, the drawings start to pile up and it's hard to stay as excited about the thousandth drawing as you were about the first. But like I said, I want to encourage my kids in their creativity, so I do my best always to respond enthusiastically when they bring their art to me. I think we take this drive to share what we made and say to other people, look what I made into adulthood. Even if it's not our art, it could be like something totally different, maybe at our work. You know, we just want to be told, good job. It doesn't matter if we're, I don't know, in HR, or maybe we are a writer. We want to know that what we're doing or what we're making is working well and that others appreciate it. We want to know that we're good at what we do or that what we've made matters to other people. I can speak for myself. As an artist, I'm kind of needy. You know, I even say this aloud sometimes or I've written, into, I've written it into my bio. I've said, I want to make work that makes others happy. I want to make work that matters. And I go to great lengths to get my work out there for other people to see. And I want them to tell me they like it. I want others to like and comment on my work. You know, even with this podcast, I want people to tell me how I'm doing. Like here I am sharing my thoughts on illustration and publishing it all over the world. And I can tell you that if I never had any positive feedback about it, I'd probably stop. It takes a lot of time to do this. I'm pouring my heart into it. This is time I could be spending maybe developing my craft as an illustrator or taking on more client work. But somehow I have this drive to share in this particular way. And why is that? Well, I believe that I have something to share that will help others. And I believe that I'm at least kind of good at it. And maybe by doing this, I'll get better at it. Maybe I'll get really good at it and it will become my main job. Or maybe it will just become a solid secondary source of income. Or maybe it will lead to just something totally unexpected and like some kind of unexpected opportunity in the future. Mostly though, I'm doing this because I get value out of it myself. I enjoy writing and I enjoy speaking and connecting to others over what I make. But I wouldn't be doing it at all if I thought I was bad at it or that I wasn't at least on some kind of trajectory of getting better. And how will I know if I'm getting better? It will be by the feedback I get from others. It will be through the comments I get on YouTube or in my DMs on Instagram. 
It will also be through analytics, like, you know, these charts that tell me how many views I'm getting on my episodes. I'll know which episodes are getting the most play. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. As I've been thinking and writing on the topic of feedback, I've realized how much we often seek out affirmation and validation. When we think about getting feedback, I think we often want comfort, not solutions. We want to be told our work is good. We want some kind of certainty that we're on the right track. At first, when I started writing this episode, my focus was more around the idea of feedback as a way of getting better. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that so often, the feedback that I myself want, even if I don't realize it at the most conscious level, is this sense of validation. I seek out positive feedback and I avoid negative feedback. You know, negative feedback is scary because it can be my undoing. I know that if something I'm doing is wrong, it could call into question the whole thing. I'll be honest and say that so much of my process and practice has been shaped by the need for positive certainty and the need to minimize negative uncertainty, also known as doubt. Because there are so many ways to go wrong. I suppose that I've decided that it's counterproductive to focus on the negative. Every time I do, I find myself on the edge of despair and, you know, sometimes even on the edge of depression. It's been helpful for me to focus on my strengths, to lean into what I know I'm good at and to avoid what I'm not so good at, or at least to avoid things that are so challenging as to make me spin off into doubt too often. It becomes counterproductive to be perfectionistic or overly grandiose in my aspirations as a so-called great illustrator. It also becomes pretty unprofitable. I'll spend all my time trying to be perfect while I'm missing deadlines and not able to take on new work. So now as I'm speaking to you about how to seek out feedback and how to get the most from it, I have to be honest with you and with myself about the reality for me, which is I'm a little fragile. I'm a fragile artistic soul. And very often I just need someone to tell me, Tommy, you're doing great. I guess I'm a little bit addicted to comfort. Now, I want to validate this need for comfort or affirmation. How could we go on doing anything without positive reinforcement or without some kind of reward? How could an actor keep performing on stage without applause at the end? Or how could a comedian keep telling jokes without hearing the audience laugh? How could an artist keep making their art without knowing it means something to others. A huge reason for seeking feedback is to at least have some sense of what we're doing right. But if that's all we seek, we'll never truly get better. And of course, this is really what we need to talk about today. How can we get feedback that will help us grow and improve as artists? And how can we get feedback that doesn't destroy our tender little artist hearts. I think creativity is a fragile thing and it requires delicate handling as much as it needs a thick skin. In the last episode, we talked about the question, how do I know if my work is any good, especially in the absence of outside feedback? My take is that this is really the wrong question to be asking. The only thing we can know with more certainty is whether the art is working as intended, and that means the work is supposed to do something, and that means we need to know what our work is supposed to do even before we make it. Ultimately, when we know what our work is supposed to do, we can stop worrying so much about how good it is, whatever that means, and focus more on figuring out how to make it work. But where we left off from the last episode was that it's entirely possible to set up very clear objectives in the first place, say in a creative brief or in a class assignment, but to still not be very good at making whatever the thing is. It's possible to be great at setting up 
a brief but not so great at illustrating or making the art or design or whatever you happen to be tasked with making. And that's where outside feedback comes in. We need feedback to know if our work is working in the eyes of others. So yes, sometimes we need affirming feedback that tells us we're all right. We want comfort, not solutions. But often, getting feedback is about knowing if our work is truly doing what we intend it to do. We need solutions. Of course, this is the kind of feedback that's going to cut closest to our tender hearts, sometimes piercing through our thick skins and sometimes sending us on the verge of an existential crisis. And this is, of course, going to be when we're most vulnerable. But if we're ever going to grow up as illustrators past the five-year-old Tommies who just need to be cheered and encouraged, we have to volunteer to be vulnerable to stick our necks out on the chopping block and wait for the ensuing butchery. Okay, hopefully it's not going to be that bad. In fact, feedback doesn't have to be terrible at all. Really, feedback can be a really positive experience if we go into it knowing why we're getting into it and knowing what we'd like to get out of it. You know, you may not know what all your questions are right now, You might have just this foggy notion that you need feedback of some kind. And that's okay. Sometimes foggy is the best we have, and that's all we can know, and that's fine. But I encourage you to think about the question. I mean, really, really think about the question the next time you get feedback. Do you need comfort or solutions? Are you looking for someone to cheer you on, or are you looking for someone to help you grow? Just understanding what you need right now will help you find the feedback that's right for you and get the most from it. Now, before we go, it's time for a little thing I call listener mail, where I read and respond to some of your comments that (laughs) come into me in response to previous episodes. Today's note comes from Capavera Gorda on YouTube. In response to episode three, this is what he wrote. I absolutely disagree with you 100% without a doubt. You don't know what you're talking about. You're wrong because... And then he leaves us like really long space. And then I I had to kind of scroll down to the bottom to read this. This is how he finishes it. Your hair looks great. Capavera, you really got me with this comment. I honestly thought that you were going to come in and actually like provide me some actual fiery disagreement. I love when people come in with critical comments because it actually gives me a lot of fire in my belly and I have something to react to. And I was really excited about that. So I'm a little bit disappointed that, you know, you just wanted to tell me that my hair looks great. And for context, uh, at the beginning of that episode, I was being a little bit self-conscious about my hair because it was kind of spiking up as it does when it's not cut. But my point here is that, um, yeah, I, I think I was relieved that someone wasn't like totally like giving me hate comments but I was also kind of disappointed because I actually really do like responding to um, fiery opinions anyway thank you so much for the the compliment I appreciate it Capavera I love reading your notes your comments your questions if you want to send me one the easiest way is by leaving a comment on YouTube or if you're on Patreon you can drop me a line there You can also send me your questions by DM on Instagram at Mr. Tom Froze. My name is Mr. Tom Froze, and those were my thoughts on illustration. You can find links to all my things at tomfroze.com, including my Patreon, YouTube channel, and Skillshare classes. Remember to rate, review, like, subscribe, follow, tell your friends, all those lovely things. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. I'll see you in the next one.